Um, is there any community input tonight? All right, then next on the agenda is superintendent's report. Just wanted to share that the uh, opening days last week for faculty and staff went really well, and uh, as well as our orientations, it was really uh, wonderful having pre-K here, which is a nice addition. I'm really hopeful that we're able to fully incorporate that as, it, you know, this is a, I think a three-year total uh, grant that we have, uh, so hopefully that by the time we get to that three years, it will be embedded and we'll be able to expand. Uh, today went great as far as the students coming back and uh, I heard really great um, just some anecdotal stories about uh, lots of smiling kids, happy kids, uh, very compliant with all the protocols in place, knew them and classrooms, classroom teachers re and uh, at all levels reminded the students uh, around protocols and the trainings. Um, and uh, got into their days and are ready to, to get going. I know we had some exhausted teachers too at the end of the day. You can see them, uh, they're still, many of them still here. So a great start to school. And um, I know our teachers especially appreciated the time at the beginning of the year to really get prepared for uh, in-person instruction, uh, really get their classroom set up uh, to be, we are, our, our desks are for the most part three feet apart and to organize that and it just takes a lot of um, strategic planning around your material supplies and little things like having two desktops in your classroom or one desktop because of, of just space and uh, same with our um, facilities and technology department so it was really great to get that set up um, you know at the same time the state has requested that we have a plan in place for any time uh, as, a gr as a grade level or building, we go uh, virtual for any reason, um, what, whatever's happening in the community. Um, we are not uh, necessarily providing uh, remote or virtual instruction on the dime if a student goes into quarantine. And that's something we'll be sharing with families as we move out move on with, with different things. We will certainly have the Google Classroom set up with resources, asynchronous instructional uh, minutes and um, things like that, but we do not have hybrid happening. We do not have um, the ability or virtual teachers, so the ability to easily make that happen. And uh, there's also some uh, legal qualifications on that we're, we're learning about and just trying to manage right now to figure out. So we're learning more about what that would look like. We are set up though if we needed to go uh, large picture uh, virtual pretty quickly to be able to, to do that. I have in your um, in your folder, so if you went to your drive, in the drive, and it would be drives shared with me, and it would be called called the Lansing Board of Education you will be able to then see documents in there. And I have included, uh, there in there's a calendar of dates for some committee meetings. There, um, there's going to be a calendar of presentations and other dates in there as well. We're kind of working that out so you can see ahead what the presentations will look like. Um, we, at leadership this summer, instead of having large presentations like we did last year, especially if they end up being over Zoom, we are doing it by building. So, your first, so next leader, uh, board meeting is when leadership team comes. The elementary school we're presenting on an overall view of the building, academics, what's happening, what's going on in the building, and then, and then we'll have a, meet, a work, be a board meeting, a working board meeting, and then it will be middle school, and so forth. And every building will go twice. So it's a good picture look at, at what what's happening. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to share some. We're just getting in some of the academic data from the state that happened last year. So I'm really curious to see how our students that chose to take uh, Regents or the 3 through 8 testing uh, fared um, last school year. So we'll be able to start sharing that information with you as well. Chris, may I just ask a question about mm -hmm. that, please? I don't know if I'm in the wrong spot or not, but everything I see is... 2019 to 2020. I don't see anything from 2020 to 2021. And it may just be that I have bookmarked the wrong spot or I'm not sure. I can see um, the district meetings, but not anything Yep, so the else. district meetings, I don't, I'm not sure if they're in 
Like, I don't see That's board policies or our goals, superintendent goals. I, w I wonder, Susan, if you could send Chris a reminder email to have her check on that so that, but yeah. that's a good Sure. Catch. Yeah, I don't know if um, everybody else can see why it. Why don't I... I'm, I'm the same. I'm looking at my shared folder and I don't have that. It's shared with you. It's not your shared folder. Right. It's a right. shared drive. It's a shared drive. Is it a shared folder or a shared drive? It's a shared drive. So, so say shared with me. Yep, Lansing Board of Education. Yep. And you're not, it's not opening? Yep. No, I have it. It's open, but there's no updated information in it. I don't see any updated information. Hmm. Yeah, you see like 2019 board operating. I do. 2019 I to 24 policies, et cetera. Correct. Because yeah. I see it right here. So look, maybe there's a rights or something that has to be shared with you, but it should be just sh automatically shared with you when it goes into that drive. So sure. I'll send you a note just to remind you that. Um, and then you know what we could do is check it. Um, if you don't hear back soon, we'll check it at agenda planning to make sure it's all sure. up and working. OK. Yeah, I'll double check before I leave actually tonight, though, too. But um, OK, so. So there, there's that. The only thing I really would like to highlight you on for uh, what's up and coming, especially around uh, facilities, um, as you know, like we've we were able to finally finalize some of our big project things that are happening around HVAC that that we started a, two years ago now almost because we're in the middle of finalizing. We had finalized all that. We're middle of just getting started when uh, COVID when we had closure, school closure. And we were able to do some, but with materials and supplies, it just took a long time with construction over that time period. So um, as we move forward, our biggest projects now really are around our athletics and our facilities, or outdoor facilities, and some, some indoors as well. But we will be starting those facilities meeting coming up soon. I'll make sure that calendar is in there. And it hopefully... This will be a quite a, a large project, a lot of community involvement, and a, a, a great deal of publicity and looking at for possibly some people, you know, we have the CDC that does technology, we have our sports boosters, to really get sports boosters involved to have as much community support as, as we can and possibly um, actually doing a campaign for donations for around different things. So um, those are things that we're looking at. Uh, so around facilities, so I, I would expect a big year around really uh, communicating about our athletic facilities and um, just our grounds in general and trying to uh, improve the limited landscaping uh, available acreage that we have. So um, a lot, lots more to come around that. Okay. All right. Uh, school business administrator. All right, so we had a little bit of a bumpy start um, for transportation-wise over the last couple of days, um, but I think they have finally worked all the kinks out. Um, I know the bus has left today at 4 o'clock for the elementary school, which is a little bit later than usual. Um, and part of that was because the trip for the middle school and high school took a little bit longer than anticipated, so the buses got back. So we're hoping over the next couple of days we'll smooth all that out, including drop-off and pick-up. Uh, we have a lot more students on campus than we did at the beginning of school last year, so working out the kinks on that, um, that process and how we're putting traffic through is still a work in progress. So hopefully, you know, everyone in the community can bear with us as we work out the kinks on that. Uh, we are still looking for cleaners, so we continue to push a campaign to try to hire some cleaning staff. Um, we're still short about four staff members. So if anybody is interested or knows of anybody who's interested, if you could please send them my way, I would be happy to talk to them. Uh, food service, we are continuing to serve meals in classrooms and in the cafeteria in this building. So we're working through the logistics of that as well, trying to maintain social distancing and have the food available to students. But I think they've come up with a pretty good plan uh, to provide those meals to students in this building. And in the middle school and high school, they're going through the line like they did last year and going back to spaces where they can socially distance. So that seems to be going well. Uh, the last thing is the natatorium. If you've been in there in the high school pool area, there's a large section that's blocked off. Part of the HVAC work that we put on hold for a little bit to make sure we had available funding was to remove the old unit that hasn't worked for a few years and replace it with a new unit. 
So right now space for spectators is limited in that area and that should be finalized by hopefully by um, January. That should be done. Any questions for Kate at this point? I just have a quick question about um, food service and um, mm -hmm. how are you feeling about the response to your outreach with regard to having folks sign up for free and reduced price lunch? We have put a hold on sending that information out for okay. now. They haven't been it. There was an issue with the direct cert file. It was the last year's file, and so the state is trying to update that. So we haven't done our direct cert, so we're waiting for that to be finalized before okay. we do a push out to make sure that we capture anybody who didn't get captured in that direct cert. Um, hopefully by next week. Um, as of last week, they hadn't sent us the updated file yet. Um, hopefully that'll let some of the paperwork calm down that's coming home from school, and so it'll be something new and fresh in the mail um, that families receive, and so they can really take a look at it. So I'm hoping that that works out to our benefit, actually. Thank you. Okay. Hey, are there any uh, committee reports tonight? I have a... So. Not from you, Susan? No, I said I do have something, but if others are. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, this is, there are several things. The first, um, I just wanted to mention that I'm going to go to the NISBA um, seminar tomorrow, tomorrow. Right. Um, on the um, uh, 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 community input and, and um, akin to the one that Central New York School Board Association did a few weeks ago. Um, and just wanted to suggest to everyone that it might be wise to ask our policy committee to have a look at those updates, uh, review our policy and practice, just make sure everybody is familiar with it. Not anticipating any problems, but of course always good to have those things buttoned up before such a thing were to occur. Um, and then I just had a question about um, NISBA uh, conference. Uh, what the plan is, if, ever, if anybody is going to go, and how reporting back is going to happen. I know for myself, I'm, I'm not going to go to New York uh, City for that. That just seems a little mm -hmm. bit beyond what I'm comfortable with, and, and it's a lot of time. Um, I am going to go instead to Rochester for the um, leadership conference that they're having, NISBA is putting on, uh, just because it relates to the topics that are coming up with regard to our two um, retreats in October. So I thought that that was a better use of our resources and time. And then um, Central, no, TST BOCES SBA, we start actually on Friday. Normally it's the first Monday of the month, but obviously things are all messed up for September. One of the things that we'll be doing on Friday is setting um, our presentations for the year. And every school district is asked to suggest at least one um, and the idea, again, is to be sharing best practice or something unique that we're doing or something new that we're doing um, as a way to, you know, information share with other districts. And so we've had great presentations from Lansing in the past. If there's anything that anybody would suggest, any of your teams, Chris, that are doing something that you want to send me a little note about, I'll be sure to get them scheduled at a time that works for their schedules for that. Thank you. Um, I did contact NISBA. The webinar tomorrow will be recorded and yeah. be viewable by all of us. Um, I have been in touch with Central New York School Boards Association as to why the recording of their um, session has not come out. And um, the administrative assistant there said they're, they're working on it or something. I have a feeling that they, there's some redundancy between what Central New York does and what NISBA does, so they might ha have some issue with that or with uh, legal, because legal had to give permission. So um, I'll let you know as soon as I find out and when Renee tells me. I will also be going to um, the uh, TST BOCES thing on Friday because it's a Zoom meeting. Yes. And I will definitely go to that. Um, and I'm trying to think. Oh. Uh, Probably at our um, workshop with Jamie from NISBA, one of the things I would like to talk about is how much money the board spends annually on workshops and attending things and how we can equitably um, allocate who goes to what and how much money we're spending. So that could be something that we talk about at our workshop. 
Okay, on to presentations, school opening, testing. slide on to the uh, page that is for uh, testing and screening as you know uh, the governor came out um, not long ago uh, about a week and a half or so ago and stated that uh, schools in certain areas schools uh, would have to do some testing and screening and so I wanted to go through that with you so you knew what it was what it entailed and what it's going to look like at Lansing so first, just to share with the who, as far as who would we have to test, and they talked about teachers and staff, and that ap applied to basically all school district faculty, teachers, substitute teachers, any teacher, uh, stu stu student teachers that join us, administrators, paraprofessional support staff, any type of contractor that's on, a, anybody that's like on a regular basis in Lansing would be subject to have to go through the screening process of testing. And how often? Uh, it's minimally uh, once per week when we're identified as having either a low, moderate, or substantial or high uh, transmission rate. Uh, we're currently in the high transmission rate. So that's definitely at least once per week. And uh, it, it is for vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals Unvaccinated individuals would be required to uh, test. Vaccinated uh, individuals would opt out or opt in. And, um, or if you're not willing to share your vaccination status, you'd be requ required to test. There are ways to prove your vaccinated status, and that was just uh, the Excelsior Pass, the CDC vaccination card, or a health uh, provider signed note. So uh, we did ask our, all of our employees and um, um, people that were, uh, you know, affiliated with Lansing that we know about right now, uh, optionally, they could have filled out a uh, vaccination status. I'll share what their rates were so you just have an overall view of what the district's vaccination status looks like uh, towards the end here. Uh, the, a little different for um, students, screening testing for students is uh, optional. We, have, we are required to offer it. Uh, screening tested to unvaccinated and vaccinated if we so choose on a weekly basic uh, basis in the same, uh, the CDC areas of, for moderate, substantial and high. So there's a difference between screening testing and diagnostic testing. Diagnostic testing is when you actually have a symptom of COVID and you are required to uh, have a test for symptoms due to your symptoms. So we're offering both screening and diagnostic testing on site. The type of screening testing that we do, are doing is uh, pooling testing. The, the screening testing will be with the nasal swab of the base of your nose. And uh, we will be actually using a, a um, service for that through a company called Affinity. It's at no cost to the district. It is th through a federal grant. And they will be doing all of this screening process. Only That's the only thing that they are allowed to do is screening. So if I have a group of students, like say we say athletes are going to all be screened, um, they would, could do that, or faculty or staff. It just has to be one, at least one student uh, to, for them to do all of our faculty and staff. Uh, so uh, they, that will be started. Our first training with them is um, September 23rd. And our goal is to have this up and running shortly after that. Before you move on, so is that going to be on campus? I guess I missed that part. Is it? This it will be on site. It will okay. be on campus. You could do camp on campus or off campus through a facility. Um, certainly, uh, we really want our people coming to work and needed to have this process be as easy as possible. So that is screening, and then the diagnostic testing is a little different. It is um, so uh, that is through CMC is doing that for us. Uh, here on site 
will have it here, and PST BOCES will be the transportation. So they will come pick up on a daily basis the, um, the tests and then bring them to uh, CMC for testing. Yes? And so that would be for a student, someone who, sh who is ill is getting a diagnostic, is feeling ill, mm, there, symptoms, is getting yeah. a diagnostic. It would be offered for the family they to do it. They could do that here. Mm. Otherwise, they would have to do it off-site prior to return. Correct. Yep. Um, Chris, is, uh, I think it's the AS lab for diagnostic as well? Well, we're not sure yet. Uh, it's, it's CMC. It's what they have available. So there's two types. So there's two different things. And there's pros and cons to, to both. The swabs are much less expensive and a lot easier, and, but have to have some type of refrigeration to transfer. This, um, the spit test is, is expensive. That one's $60. The swabs are $5. Uh, the spit test is much more difficult to get samples, and it's more expensive, but we have a lot of those available to the, the county. So we're trying to see what's the best way, and um, we'll know more from CMC what they're going to offer us. Okay. Yeah, the reason I asked is the refrigeration component, mm -hmm. right, of having to keep your swab samples and the liquid media in your refrigerators until the pickup comes. Right. So you can't stay out for more than 90 minutes. So the Infinity will be managing all that for us locally. I mean, it might be our people with their stuff. Um, and then TST and CMC are going to coordinate together to make sure that they have the right refrigeration. And Great. so I having an expert on the board. Yeah. <laughs> you know, from a resource, right? Like a state mm -hmm. have to go buy some mini fridges. Yeah. Yeah. To have yeah. Available, or are we going to be putting swabs next to like the yogurt? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like those no, things that, you yep. struggle with. So that's yeah. why it's top mm -hmm. nine. Yeah. Our biggest issue will be um, location and making sure that we spread it out enough so there's not a large population of people in one area. So, well, that's what we're working on uh, right now. So, so if the, you do the sorry. So if you do the diagnostic or the the screening testing, and it's students, is it the parent or guardian bringing them to the testing, or is it the school saying, oh, this class has to go for a screening now? Or is it still being discussed? So the screening, for the screening and the diagnostic, we have to get parent permission. So it could either be us, our nurse calling, saying your, your child has symptoms, we can do this diagnostic and then send them out to you, or you could take them elsewhere, or you can come bring them in, you come in. However, we, you know, those are all the protocols that we have to um, manage. That's for the diagnostic. Screening is the same thing. Parents would have to sign up. Once they signed up for it, it would just happen. We would not need, you know, permission again. If there's a quarantine situation um, where students have to quarantine, we could also do that di diagnostic then, and they could do determine. But it's for for students, it's always optional. For faculty and staff, it is it is not. Uh, they would have, you know, where the screening is not optional. Um, the diagnostic that have to be completed too, but could be doesn't have to be with us. Uh, you know, we've had a m some situations last year where people would say, I can't get into, into testing until these five days later, so now it, you're looking at a 10 day, so this will be helpful with that. So we could certainly have people come in. For this diagnostic testing, obviously that's individual based. For the pool, for the screening, they're doing the pool testing where they'll test say 25 to 50 uh, samples at one time. If it's if COVID's found, they will then do them individually. Um, so that's that's how how that works. Uh, right now, like I said, training starts on 9:23 for the Infinity. I'm working with that group. All of our nurses are doing that, and um, we've already had the training for diagnostic testing and conversation with CMC. So it's just setting up the all the protocols around what what this looks like. Um, and kind of moving forward uh, from there. So this is our next, our actual next community conversation or Zoom will really be around this to explain the exact type of testing we're doing, who sees those results, where do they go, uh, because we will be also asking student vaccination status as an optional for parents to share with us. Um, 
uh, and uh, want, really just want to be as transparent as we can with the process so people feel comfortable with it uh, as we kind of move forward here. Uh, just so you're aware, we did have um, most of our, our, vaccine, our uh, faculty and staff have, did complete the survey. We are 91% fully vaccinated, 1% partially vaccinated, meaning they've completed one um, dosage or, of that, and 1% unvaccinated, and then 7% unknown at this time. So we've now we're coordinating all of those. Uh, this was not an anonymous. This was obviously a known. So we're coordinating all the people we have with, the un, with who we don't have, and that's how we're going to uh, establish our screening process for uh, all the people on campus. Um, I will say too, like just uh, as most of our vaccinated staff opted out of weekly testing, knowing that they could just come get tested anytime that they choose to, uh, but they didn't want to be the have to go every week or more if we decide if it ends up being a higher transmission rate. So uh, this is where we're at with the testing and screening and hopefully all will be in place ready to go in a, in a, within two weeks. So with the 91% vaccinated, there's, is there a protocol somewhere in the school or in the county or state for the vaccinated who end up positive with corona? If, if they ha are vaccinated and they are, have symptoms? Yep. Or just, and they end up having corona. They, they do end up getting the Delta variant or another. Well, we have to, we still have to report daily to uh, the COVID dashboard for schools. And then anybody at all. There's no state mandated. Like, there's the mandated either vaccinated card or, or weekly testing, whatever the testing is, but there's not one for vaccinated only when you have symptoms. If you have symptoms, then the yeah. county has something for this symptomatic. It, with, the, with, the, no, with, the positive, with the positive case, then you go into quarantine, but there's not a school testing, there's not a state mandate. It's the, it goes back to the county quarantines or what goes with the positive cases for the vaccinated. Yeah, well, we don't do anything at all with, we cannot quarantine people right. in the district. And we always make that clear because yeah. parents like will take our word for things and it's really just the county. So as far as testing, there's vaccinated people that are asymptomatic, do not have to be tested at all for screening. If they're symptomatic, they have to do the diagnostic testing. Um, as far as, as, far as cor being quarantined, uh, what they're recommending, if, if I was vaccinated and I came in contact with COVID, they recommend that you wear a mask, that you isolate, that you do those things, but you're not officially in quarantine and that you do get tested three to five days. But they're not putting vaccinated asymptomatic people in quarantine. Right. Um, I have found though through experience with this, there, there is probably a two to three day period where you're waiting for your test results, if you are getting tested, where you're, whether if it's a close, now they just came out with pretty specific understanding of what a close contact is. Um, that you may have a couple of days where they're asking you to be in quarantine while they do research and trace and really see what your, your contact. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you know, it's different than last year where it was, you're in this classroom, you're in quarantine, you do this. Now there's a lot more research and, and um, understanding around severity of illness. What is, could the impact be? What is the likelihood and uh, things like that. And more responsibility for me to go get tested regardless of them putting me on quarantine. Now for our employees, if they are exposed, we're gonna have them test mm -hmm. within three to five days. It's not going to be a, we recommend, we're gonna say you need to, it's, we have it right here, go get screened. You know, so um, we will do that. Uh, and with the, with the symptomatic vaccinated, that, what happens with them? Well, if they have symptoms and uh, they can't come to work, and then they'll have to get tested. Okay. And then and if then they're COVID there. positive, they will go into quarantine. Okay. Uh, anyway. I just wonder, are we also doing the temperature with the... We are. We're not doing the daily screening electronically because that, that was a state mandate that's uh, been lifted. But um, 
at the doors or in the classrooms we're, we're doing temperature checks. I have to be very uh, transparent with that. That was not something that led to us having a bigger understanding of student health. Uh, you know, by the time they came to school, they were, they, the, the temperatures weren't, they weren't, it didn't catch students that were sick typically. Maybe later in the day if they had a fever or something, we, we would have something then, but it was typical. It's just one of those, when we're approaching it as this layered approach to mitigate COVID, it's just one of the layers. It's one of the lower impact layers, but it's in there as a potential well, safety net to say we may, somebody may come to school with a fever. So are you, so you're saying that um, the county came out, the county health department came out with more guidance for quarantine and with close contact. So is your plan to um, clarify that at the community meeting for um, COVID? Is that the plan or you have looked at today for it? Um, for the, I don't know. I mean, it's on our website and things. I can share that with you. It's on the Tompkins County uh, page. And it really just talks about, um, you know, how close were you in contact with that person for six, within six feet for 15 minutes with a mask, without a mask. And then they have uh, school uh, protocols too around close contact that are different, actually a little more lenient to keep schools open. So there's, you know, it's pretty, you just got to kind of go through it. So it's, it's much more like, yeah, situational, subjective, this time where there's conversation, uh, whereas in the past it was like 10 minutes, here, here, you're out. And now we're having more uh, conversation around, around things. And hopefully we'll keep moving forward as we are because we are seeing some numbers decrease and things get managed a little bit better. Uh, as we're settle in. So, uh, uh, so what I'm doing is every two weeks, I'm really evaluating the data and looking, certainly looking at the county. It's hard for us to change protocol while, while we're in the red zone. Once we get down to the uh, yellow, uh, we, we have much more flexibility and we'll be able to look at things like masking outdoors. That would be the first thing that we would uh, take away as a protocol that's necessary. So we're managing that on a, reg on a regular basis, daily basis. Okay, thank you. And thanks for the questions, everybody. Uh, budget presentation. That's more interesting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Where is yours? Right I mean, right okay. Right. okay, okay, right there. <laughs> So I have a very rough view of our 2020-21 uh, school year as far as budget. These are unaudited results. The auditors are clearly looking at these numbers, but these are just reports that I ran and wanted to kind of give you an idea of where I think we're going to land. So for our budgeted uh, revenues and expenditures, we were just over $31.5 million. And then where I'm projecting we're going to end is in that middle column. So our revenues are... Um, as you can see, a bit higher than anticipated at 33.9 million. Um, and I'll get into the details of why these numbers are so much different. And same with our expenditures, they're at 32.5 million. And our encumbrances are at 34, uh, 340,000. So that's a difference. Our, we underspent our revenue by just over $1 million. So here you can see that middle column is where I'm forecasting we're going to land. I actually meant to follow along so I didn't have to try to stare at the screen. Um, and the right hand column all the way shows whether we were favorable or unfavorable. So if we were favorable and, and our revenues were higher than anticipated or expenses were lower than anticipated, that's in black. And if um, it was the opposite of that, it's in red. So you can see those areas where we came under or over budget, and I'll get into some detail on what those are and what that means and how that happened. So for our revenues, and I kind of put a little um, synopsis at the bottom with, with the numbers, that local amount, our BOCES refund was much higher than projected. Um, typically that comes in 
We budget for that around 300, 400,000. This past year it came in at 700,000 and that just means that um, what they anticipated it would cost for them to run some of our programs came in much lower or we budgeted for things that um, perhaps changed mid-year. An example of that would be if we budgeted for 10 students in the PTEC program and only seven participated, we've paid for the 10 so they refund us the difference. Um, our state sources came in a little, a little under budget the primary reason for that is that CARES Act funding was originally budgeted for in that state aid uh, section. However, it came in under federal aid. So you can see just below that, the federal sources are higher than anticipated, and that's all that is, was that 180,000 of CARES Act money was the bulk of those differences. So the interfund transfers and proceeds obligations for both the revenues and expenses, this is the bulk of why our revenues and our expenses are so much higher. When we use our capital reserves for a project, we have to take in the capital reserve in as a revenue into our budget, and that was $2 million. Um, so that's why that's so much higher than anticipated. And then if you go to the next slide, you can see at the bottom our interfund transfers were $2 million higher than expended because that's where we moved that money over to the capital fund to pay for that project. So it really is an in and out, but it inflates our numbers significantly. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I explained that. The other reasons for um, underspending our budget, uh, personal services, which is payroll um, and overtime. Uh, our, re our payroll was significantly reduced for a number of reasons. We didn't have any overtime. We weren't running drivers on trips, field trips, athletic events. Um, we had um, limited athletics, so the cost of coaches was a bit lower than what we budgeted for. We had very limited uh, extracurricular activities, so those um, costs were much lower. And then the benefits associated with that lower payroll are um, the reason for the benefits there. Um, I did the math and our benefits, it actually is 35% of our payroll, which is about what our fringe rate is. So that's right in line with where that should be. Equipment, supplies, and contractual, um, we kind of came out about even once you do all the math on that. Um, while our COVID expenses were much higher for so some of the supplies, and we were really careful and frugal with some of our spending for equipment and other contractual obligations. So because of careful planning, we were able to kind of offset the cost of buying all the PPE, running the HVAC more continuously. And then again, that interfund transfers. Um, sorry, Kate. Yeah. So are we saying there that we had less principal but higher interest? Yeah, it was just budgeted um, in the wrong line. Oh, OK. <laughs> Um, typically, that's with our ban. We never know how the interest is going to flow for our one-year ban. So we, we know it's going to be somewhere. But in this case, it was um, in interest instead of principal. Gotcha. So here, I kind of did a breakdown of how this affects our unappropriated fund balance. At the beginning of the year, our unappropriated fund balance was just under 900000 so you add our revenues, take away our expenses and our encumbrances, and um, I'll just explain quickly that the encumbrances are things that we ordered and have arrived, but we haven't yet paid for. So they roll over to the next year. Um, so that, and in a couple of slides previous, I kind of laid out where all those were. A lot of it was contractual and supplies. So we got all the stuff and we just hadn't gotten the invoices and processed the payment yet. So that puts our ending fund balance at just under $2 million. Um, if you click on the link, On our website, on the business office page, uh, Chris, if you scroll down all the way at the bottom, there's a link there that's 2020-21 budget performance information. If you're interested, there's a lot more detail there that kind of gets into the, all the numbers. So if you want to look and see a bigger breakdown, will you click on that for me, please? Maybe. Yeah, I was going to watch Monday Night Football, but <laughs> <laughs> if you click on, and that kind of gets into all the details. Some of those I did screenshots of, and if you click on the second one on the left, um, at the top you can see revenue variance, exp uh, expense variance, and detailed variance reports. That kind of gets into all the nitty gritty details. So that is up on our website if anybody's interested. So, um, as you know, we have an obligation um, that we're supposed to stay under 4% of unappropriated fund balance. At the end of last year, we were just under 3%. 
If we do nothing with what I'm expecting us to end with, we will be at 5.89%. Um, that's not necessarily a terrible place to be at right now. I know a lot of districts are going much higher. Um, if we land exactly at 4%, we would be over by just over $600,000. which kind of leads me into reserves. That's other money that we have set aside um, that we can use for things. So we have unappropriated fund balance, appropriated fund balances, which is money that we designate to use towards the budget. Um, and then we also have these reserves are part of appropriated. So I've listed all the reserves that we have. Um, I know that we've talked about these a lot, but I'll go through them really quick just as a refresher. The unemployment reserve, if for some reason we had to do a lot of layoffs and our unemployment costs were much higher than what we budgeted for, we can use this reserve to offset those costs. Um, the ERS is for the employee retirement system, so that's all our support staff that we pay retirement contributions into. If for some reason that retirement contribution rate increased significantly, we would have this reserve to use to offset those costs. For the 2021 year, we did uh, budget to use $200,000 of that reserve to balance the budget. Uh, the numbers that I shared with you do not include using that. So we did not move that money over because we did not need to. Uh, the same is for the EBLAR. If you go down to the second to last, that's their employee benefits and accrued liabilities. And we use those for large one-time retirement incentives. So a lot of our um, union contracts include retirement incentives. If people retire within certain parameters, they do get an incentive. We had allocated to use 100,000 of that for the 2021 year and we did not use that either. The teacher's retirement system is the same as the employees, but it's specific to teachers. Teachers and teaching assistants are in that um, retirement system. So we have that money to offset any uh, significant increases in contributions. The tax tertiary, um, any large tax refunds, um, typically uh, you, know, you get assessed every year, typically in Tompkins County. If you fight that and you win and you are due a refund or your um, taxes are lowered that you have to pay, after we've established our tax levy and the tax rate, um, that would be a significant hit to the district, potentially, depending on what property it was for. So this is a reserve to offset that loss. Uh, and then the capital reserve is to offset any local share of capital projects. Right now, our local share is typically about 35%. We get about 65% in state aid towards projects. We have, oop, go back. Um, we do have almost $400,000 in there. We have already, you know, two years ago, you voted to use all of that money towards the 2018 project as needed. Right now, we are under budget for our capital project. So if when that project ends, we don't have to use that, that'll still be sitting there. But if we do need it to offset local share, we have that to move over. So Chris mentioned in her um, discussion with you, the capital project starting to plan a new uh, project in the next few years. Um, mostly that'll be on athletics and facilities. That is a lot of site work. So anytime you're moving a lot of land or um, not um, doing student spaces, so classrooms or cafeterias, um, it's an increased local share. So a lot of that has to come out of the taxpayer's pocket as opposed to state aid. So those ratios are different depending on what kind of work you're doing. So we really do need to start developing a plan to offset our costs, which means we really need to start looking at increasing that capital reserve to offset that local share. So our recommendations, I'm, you know, I'm going to recommend that we wait until the final audited numbers are in place, um, but I would recommend that we bring our fund balance back to that 4% limit and put the remaining funds into a capital reserve, which I'm approximating will be about 600000 I would also recommend we had allocated 300000 out of other reserves, the ERS and the EBLAR, that since we didn't need, need those to balance the budget, that we also move those to the capital reserve, and that would add about 900000 to the reserve. I do want to point out in this last project, we allocated 2.5 million. So that's still not quite what we're going to need for a lot of site work, but at least it's a step in the right direction. But this is not on an agenda for tonight, for no, tonight it is correct? Not. I just want to kind of make you aware, um, once we have audited numbers, I'll put forth a formal resolution. But I wanted to just have you guys give some time to think about it and um, go through the numbers. anyone have any questions? I have a, a general question. I'm wondering if um, in your spare time uh, <laughs> you could you could put together some kind of um, financial workshop for us. I'm feeling a little rusty on some of this stuff and this is one of the most important things mm -hmm. that we do. 
Um, and I'm sure Matt would appreciate it. You know, it's one thing to get that financial information through something like NISBA or Central New York, but that's kind of generally what you, but specific for us, that yep. would be really good, helpful to know, sort of like teaching a high school class, you know, how, what does it take to run a school district? What are the things and um, how does this impact your, our families and things like that? Absolutely. Um, the second thing I um, am wondering about, um, I don't remember who's on our audit committee. Who's on our audit committee? I Don't believe it's Tony and Kristen. Tony and Kristen? Um, and is that scheduled for a meeting anytime uh, coming up? I can work with Ben. They, um, typically we have him come present before our first board meeting in October. Um, in the past, we've done that just with the audit committee, and the audit committee brings it to the board meeting. Last year, because of COVID, we just had him come to the board meeting. So we can do that whichever okay. way that you guys prefer. OK, because uh, I had a couple of um, email exchanges with Ben, and he made some recommendations that I thought the audit committee um, could be yep. uh, uh, added to their agenda. So I'll just pass that along to um, Kristen and to, or the whole board actually because uh, yeah that's a good idea um, but specifically maybe we can um, have the audit committee meet and look at those things. Yep. Any other questions or things for Kate right now? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, could I please have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions. That motion passes 6-0-0. Could I please have a motion to approve the attached MOA between the LFA and the Lansing Central Schools regarding ATE? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions. That motion passes 6-0-0. Could I please have a motion to approve the attached MOA between the LFA and the Lansing Central Schools uh, regarding retirement? So moved. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Abstentions. That motion passes 600. Uh, could I please have a motion to approve the attached MOA between the LFA and Lansing Schools regarding middle school course? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions. That motion passes 600. Could I please have a motion to approve the contract between the LCSD and the ASL interpreter teacher? for 2021-22 uh, school year. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? That motion passes 6-0-0. And I just noticed a big mistake that I made in not amending our oh. agenda for tonight. Um, so please excuse the lapse in protocol. Um, could I please have a motion to add action item E uh, to our agenda tonight. Okay. Any discussion? Christine, you're pretty dumb. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? That motion passes 6-0-0. Sorry about that. All right. Could I please have a motion to approve the terms and conditions of employment for the confidential employees? Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? That motion passes 6-0-0. Could I please have a motion to adjourn? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.